evening and welcome to this evening's presentation of Iron Government, a production of the Agency for Public Information. I am Bavin Olver. This evening, Health Promotions Officer within the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Shanika John, speaks to the API on COVID-19 related matters. We'll learn more about the UWI's Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development. And we'll learn more about the activities taking place as part of the National Theatre Arts Festival. These stories and more are just ahead. But first, let's join the API's Moeth Games at the news desk for Newswatch. Good evening and welcome to the news desk. I am Moeth Games. A bilateral agreement between St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland has been signed on Monday, October 11, 2021 by Minister of Tourism, the Honourable Carlos James. The agreement is the precursor to the free movement of people, goods and services between the countries. To highlight this move, Virgin Atlantic will make its maiden inaugural direct flight into Argyle International Airport tomorrow, Wednesday, October 13th. Resident British Commissioner His Excellency Steve Moore witnessed the signing of the agreement, which took place at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs conference room. An incentive of US $20,000 is being offered to academia, the private sector, civil society organizations, and entrepreneurs to demonstrate creative use, novel ideas and solution for plastic waste reduction. The Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture is encouraging citizens to become part of the Remlet Recycling Innovation Challenge. The purpose of the challenge is to support research that addresses the environmental and social problems caused as a result of plastic waste. Interested persons can obtain further information by contacting the Sustainable Development Unit by November 12, 2021 at telephone 485-6992 or via email at emdsvg at gmail.com. Misinformed allegations by the media on the integrity of its examinations has been rejected by the University of the West Indies, UWI. A release issued by the university said it is confident there is absolutely no evidential basis upon which the media reporting of increased or widespread treating can be taken as factual. Alarmed by the unfounded allegation, Vice Chancellor of the UWI, Professor Sir Hilary Becklow stated, these are highly offensive, inflammatory and unprofessional allegations because they are not rooted in any factual evidence. Professor Beckles continued saying to argue that the university is a cheater and has widespread student treating is untrue, unethical, and is an unwarranted assault on the UWI and must be rejected. The release further stated that through its quality assurance mechanisms, the university meticulously assesses and guards against any propensity for treating and takes seriously the responsibility of monitoring, evaluating and preserving the standards of its degrees and processes. The UWI remains committed to maintaining its integrity of its teaching and examinations while continuing to provide the necessary support system for students that allow them to perform at their best particularly during these challenging times. Challenges facing the region's youth were at the forefront of an inaugural meeting with the World Bank and the OECS Youth Advisory Network held on Tuesday, October 5, 2021. Two Vincentians, Mark Odian Hillox and Tiffany Pierre, were this country's representative at the meeting, which focused on data and research, climate change, regional youth strategy, and a continued collaboration. The World Bank delegation, led by Country Director for the Caribbean Country Management Unit, Lilia Buranchu, engaged a grouping of young people from across the region on a series of matters, ranging from consensual financing to mental health concerns. One of the main areas highlighted for deep discussion was support for improved statistical data and research in the area of youth development, health and environmental resilience in the region. 
Director Burunshu noted that the lack of available data or current data was one of the areas that caught her attention when she began working in the Caribbean region and highlighted a new project in collaboration with the OECS Commission as a step in the right direction. Another key area discussed was climate change. The disproportionate effects of the Caribbean as a result of global emissions were recognized, as well as the need for more action at home, especially in the areas of energy efficiency and the waste management. The delegation was briefed on the OECS Youth Strategy and several key related initiatives, such as the OECS Youth Assembly, the Youth Innovation Lab, the OECS UNICEF U Report Program, the OECS Financial Management Crash Course for Youth, and the Youth Program targeting employability in collaboration with the Prince Trust International. The critical role of youth groups in the elaboration and implementation of projects and the supporting path that the Commission plays in the achievement of these objectives was also outlined to the World Bank team. The delegation welcomed the opportunity to discuss the challenges facing youth in the region and noted the alignment of many issues raised with World Bank objectives for the Caribbean. The delegation also expressed keen interest to continue engagement with the regional youth grouping with a view to facilitate critical feedback on initiatives that target youth. The Director General of the OECS, Dr. Didakus Jules, also encouraged increased collaboration with the World Bank as knowledge experts in a number of critical areas. Thanks for viewing Newswatch. Stay with us as the API Eye on Government program continues. I am Moet for Games. In this ongoing pandemic, we as a country are running the race of our lives. Do we beat COVID or does COVID beat us? And the talk of several ways of the virus to come, how do we ensure that we come out on top? That outcome will be determined by what we do. Do we take the vaccine and protect ourselves or do we gamble with the chance that COVID will not catch us? We are in the race of our lives and the goal is to win. As an athlete, I want to get to the finish line first. The question is, do we beat COVID-19 or do we allow it to beat us? Welcome back. You're watching the APIs and Government. The initial phase of the New Kingston Port project saw the relocation of Rose Place residents as the New Kingston Port project takes shape. Here's an update on the project. The first phase of the Kingston Port Modernization Project is almost complete with the construction of homes to relocate people from Rose Place. Minister of Housing Orlando Brewster visited the site in Normans last week and was pleased with what he saw. Okay, so this morning we're here at the Lomans Bay Relocation Project, a um, project that is done under the leadership of HLDC, Housing and Land Development Corporation. Um, this project has been ongoing for, for quite some time. Um, it is part of the port project, the new and modern port project in Kingston. We have on site, on this site, we are expected to have 29 homes um, comprising of single family units and duplexes. Um, thus far we have standing approximately 20 structures, some fully completed, some with minor work such as plumbing and electricals to be done. Um, work is moving at a rapid pace and I'm sure within the next few weeks we should have most of these structures completed. As a matter of fact, um, 
just by walking around the site and talking to some of the contractors and mason and carpenters, um, an estimated time on one of these units is approximately four to six weeks based on the speed, the availability of material and all the other elements. So I am hopeful that within the next few weeks we would be here um, handing over keys and making you know, the lives and livelihood of the folks from the Rose Place area um, much better because the, this project was done um, at the cost of the government. There was no input at all from the residents who are going to be relocated and it is a, a Herculean task but it's one that the government is not daunted by because we have been doing the housing revolution for many years and this is another aspect of the housing revolution here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Work is, you, you have on site here um, a lot of workmen from different areas across the country. We have some from North Leeward, some from, from Central Leeward, some from South Leeward. We have up in, some from Kingstown, from, from West St. George, East St. George. So the work is spread, out, spread far and wide. And um, I, I am happy with the progress that have been made thus far on this project. As a matter of fact, um, this year after the eruption of La Sofre, it, it hampered some of the progress um, that was made um, here on this site. And there was a short delay because of the, 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 the recovery efforts from La Sofre. So work had, had, had closed off for, for a short time, but thank God that, you know, Soon after we were able to restart this project and, and get it up back and running. I am happy to be here this morning to, to witness another aspect of the housing revolution before my very eyes. And I know that the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they are happy. And, and, and as you have seen in previous video, we have construction work going on across this country. We have the Orange Hill site where we just had um, the prefab homes being erected there. With, with some some other works happening as we speak we we are supposed to have a start with of some homes in Cumberland we, we are also working on um, continuously on Clay Valley and, and Green Hill and Richland Park is in the mix as well so so there is a, a lot of construction happening around the island and I'm happy to be the Minister of Housing and to be playing part in this and also how could I forget um, Sandals is here on the ground and very soon we're going to see the document area abuzz with, a, a, with, with activity in the construction and construction technology aspect of things. So this morning I am here um, just doing a site visit, getting up to speed as to where we are on, 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 this, on this project and because this is a part of the port project we are going to roll out the port project very soon. So as long as this is completed we can start immediately to, 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 to facilitate our modern port, something that is needed to boost and uplift our economy here in St. Vincent. It, we would continue to see this, 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 this amount of activities um, in the construction sector as we close out the year 2021. I, I had an opportunity to go into some of these homes, um, some of the duplexes and some of the single units, and I can tell you that it is a remarkable experience to see these homes and how comfortable they are you know and you know you must be happy for the folks who are who are going to be receiving these homes the interior is done in a in a, in a proper manner it is no haphazard sort of work and I'm, and I'm thankful and i must say thank you to the contractors and the various construction companies who have worked on this site and for putting out this excellent effort and this excellent work that i'm sure that the folks who are going to be relocated from rose place they would be happy to be walking into these lovely homes and as a matter of fact um, we are at the cabinet level discussing currently that another relocation in the area of the, the, the gas station close to the hospital on the right hand side going over to Edinburgh there are few homes there that, 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 that is in dilapidated condition and we need to really pull them down so that we can clear that area for, 
for an upliftment of the Milton Keto Memorial. So we would enclose that space to make it a part of the hospital. And that is going to happen very soon, as soon as Cabinet has given the blessing on that. So, so there would be more construction happening on this site here in, in Lomans Bay. And I'm sure that, that those who are in, involved in construction, they, they would be happy to know that there's such a buzz of activity happening here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as it relates to construction. Up next, we get an update on the measures being implemented to fight against COVID-19. As we battle the unseen enemy, COVID-19, remember to be kind to each other, be a good neighbor, help someone less fortunate than yourself, be your brother's keeper. Together, we can overcome COVID-19. A message by the National Reconciliation Advisory Committee the hurricane season is upon us, and as we know, hurricanes can be dangerous. Listening to the hurricane warning messages and planning ahead can reduce the chances of injury or major property damage. Before a storm or hurricane hits, get to know your emergency shelters. Contact Nemo for the closest shelter to you. Have disaster supplies on hand, flashlight and extra batteries, portable battery-operated radio and extra batteries, first aid kit, non-perishable canned food and water, non-electric can opener, essential medicines, cash and credit cards, and sturdy shoes and raincoats. Where possible, apply hurricane roof straps. Review your insurance policy and ensure you have adequate coverage. Do not take chances with your life and property. Be hurricane ready today. Welcome back. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment continues its efforts in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. In an interview with the API on Monday, Health Promotions Officer Shanika John updates the media on the measures being taken in this fight. Here's more. Good evening and welcome to this segment of the program I have with me, Health Promotions Officer within the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Shanika John. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Give us some details of the statistics of the COVID-19 situation here now. So in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have recorded over 4,000 plus cases of COVID-19. Um, we are actually in a phase now where we're experiencing what we refer to as a spike in terms of our COVID-19 cases, where we're seeing more than what we would normally see um, outside of that period. So we're very concerned. We're talking about 100 and plus, more than 50 our positivity rate has significantly moved from 50% um, percent to about 20 thereabouts or more. So it's definitely something to be um, concerned about. As it relates to the number of persons who have died, we've had to date um, 38 persons who have died from COVID-19, all of whom are unvaccinated, that is. Um, and so the data has continued to suggest that those persons who are unvaccinated are the persons who are directly affected with the coronavirus. Has there been a shift in the rate of vaccination among Vincentians here now? We've definitely seen an, an uptake, uh, a need to have more people, the urgency and the need to have be vaccinated in St. Vincent. It's still not where we want it to be, um, but it is definitely in a better place. We've also seen quite a number of our healthcare workers, persons from different sectors increasing in vaccination, um, our van drivers um, and so forth. And we're really pleased with that. Um, but there's still quite a number of persons that we want to reach. And so our campaign is in a good place. Um, and we're going to be a little bit more aggressive with it to ensure that we get the results that we need. We ask the persons to encourage them to access their vaccination sites across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have vaccines available in all of our nine health districts across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And it's really a, a perfect opportunity for persons to capitalize on. 
What is the rate of infections among the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated? So those persons who are vaccinated and will still um, get the coronavirus, because remember with the vaccine, we said that it is still possible for you to get the virus. Um, the only thing that we did promise, uh, we did assure persons from the data, is that you'll reduce hospitalization significantly, um, the severity of the disease on your body as well, and even possible dying from the COVID-19 um, virus. And so we really want people to understand that concept. For the persons who have been vaccinated and are positive, we call them breakthrough cases of COVID-19. And for those breakthrough cases, from our last report, we recorded at least 40 of them. It could be a little bit more now, but it's nowhere close to representing the 4,000 something persons that are vaccinated. It's a very small percentage of persons. Um, and so while you, even though you're vaccinated, you can still get the coronavirus, we're seeing that the vaccine even works as a layer to sort of um, reduce your chances of possibly being um, infected with the virus. And so that is something that we really want to, persons to be mindful of. Shed some light, can you, on the protocols as it relates to a persons coming in, the different points of entry? If you're coming in via air, via sea, um, if you're in transit passenger, you are required to have a negative PCR test. The negative PCR test is a must, not an antigen test. Um, a PCR test, which is a nasal swab as well, um, for you to be able to enter the, the, the port. It must be within 72 hours prior to your trip to St. Vincent. And so that would allow us enough time for you to have that um, assessment done. If you are vaccinated, then you will receive 48 hours quarantine. Vaccinated at least two weeks prior to your travel trip. So for some persons will take their second dose or their first dose the day before they travel and feel that they're eligible for the, um, quarantine and measures for fully vaccinated. But you're actually not considered fully vaccinated until it has been two weeks from your second shot or your single shot um, of your vaccine. Um, so once you've got that, you're good to go. If you're not vaccinated, a PCR test is still required. You will be tested upon arrival or at your hotel, depending on what the assessment that we're doing in country at the time. Um, once you are cleared, you're good to go. Unvaccinated passengers would get 14 days to seven to five days quarantine time. And that really depends on the country in which you're traveling from. What about the protocols as it relates to gatherings? Our mass gathering protocol still exists. So right now, if you are doing a wedding, a funeral, if you're having a party or friends, we really recommend that it be 10 persons on the inside and 20 persons on the outside. That's indoor and outdoor gathering. The church capacity has one third of that capacity. Um, from the Ministry of Health perspective, we're really not pleased with what we're seeing in terms of the funerals for gathering, the processions, um, the still big crowd waiting outside because they're not allowed to enter the church but it doesn't stop them from being physically outside joining the procession after. And so we're extremely concerned about that. So we're even considering in, in house to discuss how we're going to mitigate and slow that. Um, so that persons, one, are not exposed and two, we're still able to slow the spread of the virus in the country. Based on the feedback among many Vincentians, is there a general consensus as to what is causing the vaccine hesitancy among the populace? I think people generally don't associate um, the benefits of the vaccine with that of their individual benefits. And so that is something that we really have to zoom in on in terms of behavior change. Um, and having worked in this area for quite some time, this is going to take some time for people to digest and to understand. Because while we are preaching that the benefits of the vaccine definitely outweighs any risk associated, there are some persons who can't identify with those words can't identify with the fact that if you do get the vaccine, it's going to reduce your severity because I've never felt the, um, what it's like to have coronavirus. I've never had anybody close to me infected. I've never had anybody close to me who have died from it as well. But as we move into this spike, it gets closer and closer and closer to home. So we have persons in the various sectors who are directly affected where their income is affected, the traffic in terms of their customers are affected. And so they are now feeling what it is like to be in this pandemic. And so that in itself is going to shift them over into getting the vaccine in an aim to get back to that level of normalcy. And, and so Sheridan, the question is, when will we get back there? <laughs> yes, that is a very popular question. When will we get back there? I mean, for St. Vincent and the Grenadines and any other country, it's going to be different. Um, our vaccination rate is not where we want it to be. 
we are hoping that at least by December we would have a significant number of persons vaccinated so that we could start to plan in country what our new normal looks like. And so with that in mind, we really want to encourage persons to capitalize on the opportunity. Okay. Well, the children will be going back to school, you know, with both modalities. Are there any protocols as yet in relation to that? We have proposed some protocols to the Ministry of Education of which they have taken under advisement and make a decision from. Um, for, for parents who have their children going out to school and they're eligible to receive the vaccine, I would encourage them to get their child vaccinated. And this is really because children tend to not be able to take all the external precautionary measures as you and I would as adults. Um, a child may not be able to understand the importance of keeping the mask on for extended period of time, sanitizing without you know, physical distancing with his or her own friends once they're out of your space. Um, and so the responsibility is then also shifted to the teacher to also to enforce the, the, the external protocols. But I strongly believe that having your child vaccinated um, before he or she enters the school gives their body also a fighting chance, especially if your child has pre-existing conditions as asthma, sickle cell, etc. These are all reasons why your child should get vaccinated to avoid that even if they do get the coronavirus, you know that they are protected internally. The global pandemic has impacted so many lives, socially, economically. What lessons can we take from this experience? I think one of the greatest lessons that I have learned personally is that we don't always need to be with somebody physically to connect with them. And I think even without, with, throughout this pandemic, I have connected with my friends. We've had, um, you know, gatherings over Zoom. <laughs> you found a new way to introduce technology to the older population to stay connected. And you've also found creative ways to continue business. And I think, if anything, that's one of the things that we have learned. Other than that, I think as public health officials, so that was more personal mm -hmm. side, as a public health official, we've learned not to underestimate the basic science of public health. And we go back to the foundation of simply washing our hands. I mean, these are things that we were taught as children going to school and everything, and we took it for granted. And here we are in the middle of a pandemic begging people to wash their hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the basic public health measures are solid goal concepts to take us through life throughout anything. And so we are in this pandemic and we are here, I remember even traveling to places in Asia, Taiwan, etc., and so forth. And you see people wearing masks and you wonder why are they wearing the mask? Because the culture is different. But here we are in the middle of the pandemic asking people to wear masks. So I, I really think um, from a public health standpoint, that has been really one of the, the, the lessons learned that the basic public health measures apply throughout. The basic infectious control measures apply throughout because even now in our hospital services and our community health services, in order to keep our services functions, our team now has to go back to those very basic measures and enhance them and enforce them to avoid spread, to include early detection and, and you know, to ensure that we are safe on our whole population. Well, thank you very much, Shanika, for spending some time here with us and sharing your knowledge and giving us some information as it relates to what is taking place with COVID-19 here. All the best to you and your team at the ministry. Okay, thank you very much and everybody stay safe. Up next, UWI launches its Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers, and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers, rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips, rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. 
Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication, increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health is shared responsibility. Welcome back. A change in climate has caused for much concern over the past decades. This has spurred the UWI to dig deep into its archives to pull resources which now sees the launch of the Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development. The API's Mweth Games tells the story. In an effort to make the world in which we live safer, a Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development has been launched by the University of the West Indies. The recent virtual launch heard from several officials, including Chairman of CARICOM and Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Gaston Brown, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Executive Director of Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development at UWI, Professor John Egard, Executive Director of Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, Elizabeth Riley, and Assistant Secretary General and Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean United Nations Development Program, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, in his address highlighted the aggressive nature of the university on the matter of climate change, noting that it is an existing threat to the Caribbean. The Caribbean is now immersed in what clearly is a threat to its economic existence, to its social relationships, and its very culture as a pioneering multicultural zone of human existence. Today we speak of the triple C. The triple C. Climate change, chronic diseases, and COVID-19 collectively representing the most devastating hurricane this region has ever encountered. Chairman of CARICOM and Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Gaston Brown, stressed that the Climate Smart Institute is critical to fill the climate education gap in an effort to transform the region to a climate resilient zone. The Caribbean was hit by over 110 storms between 1980 and 2016, inflicting nearly 95% of all damage from weather disasters. Hurricanes are already more frequent and ferocious since 2000. Therefore, we must accelerate adaptation and mitigation measures. We have made significant progress with climate resilience, but additional environmental awareness, management, research and development are required to adapt and mitigate against the effects of climate change. Climate resilience is expensive requiring the construction of more climate resilient infrastructure and buildings. This necessitates the mobilization of external resources or international grant resources and access to bespoke concessional financing, as well as the establishment of new green and blue bond financial instruments by our regional financial institutions. Prime Minister Brown said that the Caribbean is greatly challenged and desires much more assistance to implement the necessary measures. Small islands have well-known capacity challenges and we are not receiving our fair share of global finance. We must therefore be strategic and work together regionally to secure more international projects and to spend and implement approved projects to deliver impact that, it, that keeps pace with the climate change and the shift 
to a net zero carbon economy. We have suffered extensively at the hands of climate change, and we need to urgently capitalize on the opportunities of this global transition. It is absolutely important, quintessential, that we transition into carbon neutral economies as soon as possible. Executive Director of Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development at UWE, Professor John Egard, gave a brief account of the formation of the Climate Smart Institute and its purpose for establishment. Human-induced climate change has caused rising sea levels, causing coastal erosion. The climate is now varying between extremes, with extreme rainfall in some years, followed by droughts in others. In 2017, three hurricanes occurred days after each other. These were Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Jose, and Hurricane Maria. Category 5 Hurricane Irma remains the most powerful ever recorded over the Atlantic. Uh, in 2019, there was similar destruction by Hurricane Dorian, leaving, leading to years of GDP being lost uh, in hours. So what was rare has now become the new norm, leading to unprecedented levels of destruction across the Caribbean, devastating the lives of millions of people and leaving hundreds of thousands of people homeless and, dis and displaced. In order for UWE to assist the Caribbean in tackling this threat, after extensive internal and external consultations, UWE established the Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development, which we will hereafter refer to as the Global Climate Smart Institute. It will serve as a research and knowledge management hub that will consolidate UWE's climate research and teaching while providing a virtual platform for marketing and scaling climate-related research, innovation and entrepreneurial initiatives from across our five UWE campuses, as well as UWE research units and centers. UWE has significant expertise generally, but also includes six academic staff who are currently experts in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CDMA, Elizabeth Riley, said climate impacts are increasing and there are five pillars on which CDMA builds its pathway for resilience. It is built about around five interrelated pillars. Social protection for the marginal and most vulnerable, safeguarding infrastructure, enhancing economic opportunities, environmental protection, and operational readiness and recovery. This resilience pathway provides the political value proposition for a resilient state and space for a collective conversation on how this can be realized, examining roles, capacity needs, and resourcing. For SEDEMA, the establishment of the Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development presents a facility for structuring the robust research, thinking, and knowledge products to pave this pathway. Second, capacity development. Resilience is the overarching goal of the Regional Comprehensive Disaster Management Strategy, or CDM, which speaks to all hazards, all phases of the disaster management cycle, and the role of all people in advancing this agenda. From the strategy's inception in 2001, education and knowledge management were identified as priority areas of intervention. This was intentional. We recognized then that resilience building requires a cultural shift and education and a robust evidence base are fundamental vehicles to deliver this. Assistant Secretary General and Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean United Nations Development Program, Luis Felipe Lopez Calver said his organization is pleased to be part of such development as the world in which we live is more uncertain than ever before. This initiative is not only about resilience and, and, and uh, uh, a climate change response and a disaster response in the Caribbean. I think this initiative is um, a think tank, think tank that will help us think about a world with higher levels of uncertainty. 
our next Human Development Report in UNDP, Global Human Development Report, will be precisely about uh, how to manage uncertainty and how to make sure that through the exercise of individual and collective agency, we can turn uh, that higher uncertainty uh, into something positive, into opportunities for development. We strongly believe that this think tank is one that will lead the conversation in those terms uh, for the world, not only for the region. So we're extremely proud uh, to, be part, uh, to be part of this. The launch was held on Thursday, October 7th, 2021 via UWI-TV. For the API, I am with Games. Don't go away, and government continues after the break. Welcome to Opportunity Calls, where we inform you on vacancies within the government service, opportunities for training, scholarships, and much more. Stay tuned as an opportunity might just be calling you. Applications are invited from suitably qualified persons to fill a post of legal officer within the Inland Revenue Services, Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning and Information Technology. Qualifications and experience. Applicants should possess the following. At minimum, a Bachelor of Laws, LLB, from an accredited institution and a legal education certificate. The successful applicant will be required to identify legal issues to facilitate the review of tax legislation, assist the senior legal officer in coordinating legal strategies to accomplish department's goals and priorities, assist the senior legal officer in the collection and enforcement of tax legislations, perform any other related duties assigned. Applications accompanied by proof of qualifications and two recent testimonials should be sent to the Chief Personnel Officer, Service Commission's Department, Second Floor, Ministerial Building, Halifax Street, Kingstown, to reach her not later than October 15, 2021. For more information, please visit our Facebook page at API SVG. Children of the future, help them read, learn, grow. Early reading is the key, so help them read, learn, grow. Let's show them how much fun it is to read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers. Working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help your kids read, learn, grow. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org slash ELP. Welcome back. Theatre Arts comes into focus as the API's Hollis John speaks with the Public Relations Coordinator for the National Theatre Arts Festival on the activities taking place in this field. Hello and welcome to the API Studios. Joining me today is a very interesting person from the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture. His name is Sean Frederick and he's the Coordinator of Theatre Arts at the Department of Culture. Welcome, Thank Sean. you. Thank you for having me. And hello to your viewers. Yes, welcome. Uh, exciting things are happening in your department and you're here to discuss some of the new initiatives and things that are happening in this post-pandemic era, which is very interesting because, of course, theatre, you know, it's, it's people involved in, in, yes. in, in, in arts, but not only that, interactions. So what interesting and exciting things have you got planned for us? Well, in the Department of Culture, first of all, my name is Sean Frederick. I am responsible for theatre arts, as you mentioned. And uh, the initiative that we are referring is the National Performing Arts Festival. Uh, many persons will be hearing this for the first time. Uh, the National Performing Arts Festival is a new format added to the National Theatre Arts roster. Now, the current format we have in the festival, and the word format is being used so often, is we have presentations of drama from groups 
which are community groups or institutions like the community college or nursing or police, um, presenting plays, which is a full-length plays, or uh, ex uh, plays that are extended from monologues uh, into uh, acts or scenes. So what we have now is a focus on individual presentations, which is uh, giving an opportunity uh, to our poets, to our, our, our writers, to our monologue our performers, to persons who do short skits, and persons who do reenactment and, and, and improvisation. So it's now a broader, uh, an an, a much broader opportunity for those young emerging and of course established uh, presenters to present their work. So it's not restricted to a play where uh, just a few persons may have that opportunity after they would have gone through the um, audition and then selected for that play. And some people may not have that opportunity. So we want to give every single person who has an interest in uh, creating and presenting, or even if they want to present, they can give someone else their work to present. Mm -hmm. And that's what the festival is about this year. So it's not a judged um, festival per se where you're going to give prize and award um, people in different categories. It is. Um, it is a judged cat, um, it festival. It is a judged yes. category. The, um, the current festival, uh -huh. which is uh, the presentations of plays, are not um, in its competition um, elements, but this one is. So we would have adjudicators, and there may be an element where the general public is asked to to contribute to that as well, but there will be uh, adjudicators at each presentation during the month, an entire month of um, uh, activities, and at the end of it, we would award in various categories. Okay, but then the various categories, like for instance, if there's somebody who wants to come and do a lovely monologue or a sonnet or something like that, how are you going to um, maybe cross judge if that is a thing? Because you'll have well, I'm assuming you, you expect the turnout to be um, very robust in each category. Yes. So you'll have a good enough pool to, to, you know, to, to judge from, right? That's what you're expecting. Yes. One of, the, one of the interesting things is that we have provided already the guidelines um, or that is expected of each performer for each of the subcategories or each of the categories. And that guideline stipulates exactly how a person can present. From those guidelines, criteria were developed uh, for the judges to are judged in those particular categories. We have um, people subscribing already in, in large numbers to poetry, because poetry seems to be a thing. Definitely. Young writers, people doing Definitely. literature in school. Um, we have people who just write because they're at home and they're bored, or some people just love writing. So there are a lot of persons who have already entered in that area, including the monologue. That, that requires individual now to come and uh, bring that to life, you have to come with characterization and to, to actually make sure that the content that they're delivering is in, in line with um, the theme or the premise of what they wrote about. Because those presentations will, uh, the judge will have, judges will have an opportunity to see those presentations before they are uh, enacted on stage. So what if you have raw talent, somebody who is there and they feel like, you know what, I have enough material to, to not enter this um, festival. Is there any kind of support or guidance you would give within your department to help them maybe develop the confidence to yes. be able to, you know, enter this festival, you know, in, in the right way? That's an interesting question. And, and uh, just before I came here, that was what we were actually working on, the development element where once persons would have registered ahead of time, there's a registration date open and closed so that we have sufficient time to assess and do the necessary uh, background work. And once we have those entries in, uh, persons who have the skill set of training persons and offering mentorship, will, uh, there will be opportunities for these applicants to be trained, workshopped, we'll go through their work, they add the lighting element, um, with uh, technical elements rather, and uh, there is like stagecraft, they'll be trained in movements, uh, song, how to get the, you know, wow. add a rhythm to their voice, and, and even on writing development where somebody may have presented something but there's a skilled person who would mentor them in maybe how to restructure and how to get the premise or the themes within their presentation out. So yes, we are going to provide that, those levels of training throughout the entire um, month of October and probably the, the first week in, in November, my, uh, barring the fact that one of the categories come after. So 
it's not, not a matter of late entry, but the amount of entries and putting those uh, workshops or training sessions in, in place. I like that you're, you're looking towards, you know, developing people's craft. And I mean, that is all part of the, I guess, the, 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 the goal or objective of your department yes. to develop culture within St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yes. So I'm very encouraged by that. Um, I have to bring it down to real world events. Yes, but this before is... you go to real world events, I'm sorry to cut you in your question. No problem. Uh, it's, it's, we have recognized that there are hundreds of students within secondary school and those who are doing Cape theatre arts. So they, right. they're doing it, some of them are not, you know, as a subject, but they are really uh, in love and develop their passion for it. So we wanted to offer them an opportunity. Um, so they would have had the theory element of it. This is like a practical element. We started with a, a series of performances at a private initiative. So we would have asked these individuals to come and present their work and we would have been assisting them. We've had writing sessions, we have actual workshops, as I mentioned before, about stagecraft and, its, and all its elements. But this festival in its competition, um, in its competition format, it's now a way we think we can also award uh, those young writers, those young poets, those young performers for their presentations. Okay, so I'm going to bring it back to real world events. <laughs> yes. Now, of course, we're in this post-pandemic yes. era where everything is either done virtually, yes. socially distanced, or whatever. Now, how is that going to be incorporated into the festival? Have you already worked out those details? Well, before the spike, um, of course, we were considering doing a part, uh, a mixed, where we had some members of audience because we did an assessment at the, the theatre space, which is the Peace Memorial Hall, and realised if we did six feet, we reduced the numbers of chairs from 250 to 100, right? Wow. And put protocols in place to address that. But because of the, the things that are going on now presently, we have removed that completely. So um, it would not, there would not be an, an audience, live audience to that, which... Um, may pose some challenge because some of these performers rely on audience responses and right. so on and so forth. Right. So it's just going to be virtual. Um, the presentations are going to be pre-recorded and, and then we we'll do live. Wonderful. So let, yes, let's get down to the dates. <laughs> yes. Now, um, you already said October into November. Is yes. anything set or do you have dates um, um, in mind? Dates are set. The entire festival is in November. Um, every weekend in November, there is a uh, category that's going to be presented. Uh, interestingly, we are going to put some icing on the cake where we do one full-length play, and that is a Caribbean classic uh, named Moon on a Rainbow Shawl. We have already done casting for that. We had mm. an oversubscribed audition, wow. and 99% of the persons who audition have never done drama before. Wow, that's so interesting. So we, we had to do a lot of workshop. It's interesting to see the type of talent that's coming out of these young people. And it wasn't deliberately done, but we were happy when we saw a lot of new faces auditioning, and that means right. persons are excited. Right. Uh, when we mentioned earlier about the pandemic and everything else, when we questioned some of the persons who were auditioning, they spoke of the psychosocial impact the COVID right, was having definitely. on them. While at home, they're bored. Yes, they have their school work to, 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 to focus on, but they want to create and they want to be a part of something exciting. And we are doing everything in our power. They are doing everything in their power as well to ensure that we remain safe and our rehearsal, rehearsals are, are scheduled in a way where we keep the numbers very small. We social distance. If you're not reading, you keep on your mask. We sanitize and we are going to ensure not insisting on, on vaccination, we encourage it, but we're not insisting people do it because right, we can't, right. but we're encouraging persons to at least uh, do a COVID test to ensure when right. we come Wonderful. on the eve of the presentation, that is, that is cleared. Wonderful. Right? So that is one of the things that we're ensuring. So you said people are already registering and you're getting some good feedback. Um, how are they contacting you? Where, where, where are we supposed to um, get on to you? Well, uh, mainly through social media. And of course, we are happy for this opportunity to talk about it as well. Uh, and we are also using the established groups and uh, in individual as seeds to get the message out to persons that we don't have contacts for. We have a database at the Ministry of Culture that we use. 
and of course every officer who has contact to another person uh, involved in any aspect of the performing arts, we use that to get to people and to send the messages out. So we have put out a flyer on our, our National Theatre Arts page as well as the Department of Culture Facebook page and using the various social media um, platforms. Uh, we have sent out that flyer and with the various guidelines asking persons to register. Persons will send a request to the department and then we'll then forward a copy of the registration form and the guidelines to them and they fill it out and return. And if uh, anybody at home is looking at you, I guess they're going to ask for you by name. His name is Sean Frederick and he is the coordinator for theatre arts at the Department of Culture. Sean, I just want to thank you so much for visiting us here and giving us all this information. I think people um, who are listening to this, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a few calls after this, I'm hoping. So thank you so much. Thank you, and I'm grateful. I encourage everyone out there, if you know anybody who who just not in the mood right now to present because of COVID or some other reason, encourage them because it's not just for us, the uh, members of the general public. I think as a community, as a country, we need these types of presentations and we don't know how in, the type of impact they Definitely. might have on another person. So we want to encourage everybody to create, write, uh, get your poetry ready, to, to get those pens and start writing and uh, register to present. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is where we end this evening's Iron Government presentation a program produced and presented by the Agency for Public Information. Join us again on Thursday for more Iron Government. For recaps and further updates, visit our social media platforms at APISVG or www.apisvg.gov.vc. On behalf of our production team, thanks for viewing. I am Bavin Oliver. Good night.